Number 5. Hiroshi Meiyua Hiroshi Meiyua from Sakai, Japan, had an unusual psychosexual disorder where he couldn't climax unless he was strangling someone. Then in 2004, Meiyua came up with a unique way to find people to strangle. He started to contact people on several suicide websites, pretending that he was looking for someone to commit suicide with. In total, he met three victims. 25-year-old Michiko Negamato was the first one in February 2005. This was followed by a 14-year-old boy in May 2005. And just a month later, he met a 21-year-old male student. Meiyua would tell his victims that he would drive them to a secluded area where they would turn on a charcoal burning stove inside the sealed car and they would die together. Instead, when they got to the secluded area, Meiyua strangled them and then dumped their bodies. When Negamato's body was found with strangulation marks around her neck, the police were able to track down Meiyua through his email and he was arrested. Meiyua was sentenced to death and he was hanged on July 28, 2009. Number 4. Sharon Lopatka and Robert Glass Sharon Lopatka got married in 1991, and she and her husband lived in Hampstead, Maryland. Lopatka ran several internet businesses, such as rewriting classified ads for businesses and running ads on her psychic reading website. She also dealt in darker material. For example, she sold pornographic videos of men raping unconscious women. Lopatka also used the internet to talk and post messages about her violent sexual fantasies. She was turned on by receiving pain, and she was specifically looking for someone to torture her to death. Several men contacted her, but almost all of them backed out when they realized that Lopatka was serious. The only person who wasn't scared off was 45-year-old computer analyst and father of three, Robert Glass, from Lenore, North Carolina. For several months, the two exchanged long, detailed emails in which they described their dark fantasies. On October 13, 1996, Lopaka left a note for her husband saying that she was going to Georgia. She also said that she wasn't coming back and told him not to go after the killer. She also added that if her body wasn't found, not to worry, because she was at peace. Of course, instead of going to Georgia, Lopaka went to Lenore, where she met Glass. They went to his trailer home, and over the course of the next three days, Glass tortured Lopaka. She finally died when Glass strangled her to death with a rope during sex. After killing Lopaka, Glass buried her body about 50 feet from his trailer. In one of the first cases to use evidence gathered from email, the police figured out that Lopaka went to Glass's trailer. The police got a warrant and found evidence that Lopaka had been in the trailer. After a quick search of the area, they found her body. Glass was convicted of manslaughter and for possession of child pornography which was found on his computer after he was arrested. He was sentenced to 36 to 54 months in prison, however, on February 20th, 2002, just two weeks before he was set to be released from prison, Glass had a heart attack and died in the hospital. Number 3. Wojciech Stemnovich and Detlef Gunzow To most people, Wojciech Stemnovich was just a nice businessman and father who had three grown children. But Stemnovich, who lived in Hanover, Germany, had a dark fantasy life. Specifically, he fantasized about being murdered and cannibalized. Stemnovich chose to explore his dark fantasies on message boards that are dedicated to people who share similar fantasies, and in October 2013 he met 56-year-old Detlef Gunzel. Over the course of several weeks, the two men talked online and over the phone. This led to Stemnovich traveling to a bed and breakfast that Gunzel owned in a small town in the Ayers Mountains, about 40 miles south of Dresden. It's unclear what happened when Stemnovich arrived, but at some point the men went into Gunzel's homemade basement dungeon. After he was arrested, Gunzel originally told the police that he slit Stemnovich's throat, but then he later said that Stemnovich was bound and gagged and he hanged himself. Nevertheless, once Stemnovich was dead, Gunzel spent five hours cutting the body apart with a knife and an electric saw. He then buried the remains in his garden. Stemnovich's fiance called the police after he went missing. The police quickly tracked down Gunzel, who worked as a handwriting analysis for the police. They searched the bed and breakfast and found some of the remains of Stemnovich in the garden. Inside the house, they found a video that Gunzel had recorded of himself cutting up the body. When he was asked, Gunzel said that he didn't cannibalize Stemnovich, and while the police didn't find any evidence of cannibalism, they did not find all of Stemnovich's remains either. Gunzel was convicted of murder, and in 2015 he was sentenced to eight and a half years in prison. Now, some of you may be thinking that this murder sounds awfully familiar. That is because a similar case happened in Germany 12 years earlier. In that case, Armin Muez murdered and ate a willing victim that he met on the internet. Currently, Muez is serving life in prison. Number 2. Mark Dobson, Mary Hepburn, and Helen Dorrington. 
When Mark Dobson was a teenager, he became interested in Satanism and the occult. He also started to chat on the website The Joy of Satan. That is where he met Mary Hepburn and Helen Dorrington, both of Cold Lake, Alberta. After chatting for some time, Dobson and Hepburn fell in love, and in July 2001, they moved to Barrie, Ontario, where they lived together. In May 2012, 52-year-old Helen Dorrington joined Dobson, who was 22, and Hepburn, who was 32, in Barrie. The reason for their meeting was a suicide pact. They were going to commit suicide together, and then travel to a distant planet where they would be united with Satan, who was Dorrington's lover, and they would live happily ever after. On May 1st, they did some shopping, and then ate some takeout in their hotel room that they had rented at a travel lodge in Barrie. The plan was to commit suicide at dawn on Beltane, which is a Wiccan holiday. The women would take a bunch of pills, and then after they passed out, Dobson was supposed to strangle them to death. However, it didn't work out that way. The two women took a handful of pills, but it didn't put them to sleep. In fact, it made them talkative. When Dobson tried to strangle his girlfriend, she started to say no, but then he twisted her neck and heard a snap. He then picked up a box cutter and started cutting her throat. Next, he moved over to the bed where Dorrington was lying, and he slit her throat as well. Their throats were cut so severely that they were nearly decapitated. Dobson then cut his own throat and wrists, but he didn't die. Outside of the hotel room, a guest across the hall noticed water coming out from under the door. A maintenance man went to the room and Dobson let him in. When the maintenance man was let in, he saw two dead bodies on the bed surrounded by dolls and everything was covered in blood. Dobson was taken to the hospital and he survived his suicide attempt. His lawyers argued that since he was schizophrenic, that he wasn't responsible for the murders. The judge ruled that just because Dobson had schizophrenia, it didn't mean that he didn't know what he was doing and he was found guilty. Dobson was sentenced to one life term in prison. Number 1. The Alexander Family Harold and Dagmar Alexander of Dresden, Germany were a married couple who were strong devotees of the Lower Burst Society, which was a small religious sect. The leader of the group had declared himself a prophet who spoke directly to God. After his death, Harold said that he inherited the role of leader and prophet. When the couple had their second child, Frank, in 1954 in Hamburg, Harold decreed that Frank was the new prophet. And since he was the prophet, everything that he said was law, and every command he made was to be obeyed by everyone in the family. This included his sister Marina, who was two years older than Frank, and his younger sisters, Sabine and Petra, who were twins and a year younger. When Frank became a teenager, he announced some disturbing rules that were to be obeyed. He decreed that having sex with someone outside of the family would somehow make him unclean. Therefore, he could only have sex with his mother and his sisters. Amazingly, they all agreed because they thought it was their way of serving God. Rumors about the family began to spread, but when the police started to investigate the Alexanders, the family picked up and moved to the Canary Islands. They lived a private life there and the neighbors didn't know much about them. The only thing they noticed was organ music that played night and day. By December 1970, the family had been in the Canary Islands for 10 months. At the time, Marina was 18, Frank was 16, and the twins, Sabine and Petra, were 15. The family worked odd jobs to pay the bills, and on December 22nd, Sabine was working as a cook at the villa of a doctor. The doctor was surprised when Harold and Frank arrived at the villa, caked in some type of brown substance, which he thought was mud and dirt. They asked to speak to Sabine, and she came out to the patio. That's when the doctor heard Harold say, Sabine dear, we wanted you to know at once that Frank and I have just finished killing your mother and your sisters. One would think that Sabine would cry or run away, but she didn't. Instead, she took her father's hand, which was stained in the blood of her mother and her sisters, and she put it to her cheek and said, I'm sure you've done what was necessary. Harold then knows that the doctor was there, and he said, Ah, you've overheard. We've killed my wife and other daughters. It was the hour of killing. The doctor now realized that Frank and Harold weren't covered in mud. It was dry blood. It looked like they had smeared it all over their clothes and faces. The doctor told the living members of the Alexander family to stay on the patio, and he went inside and called the police. Some officers arrived at the villa to take Harold and Frank into custody, while a pair of detectives and a police physician went to the Alexander's apartment. Inside was one of the most horrific scenes the detectives had ever come across. Blood was splattered everywhere. In the living room were the bodies of Marina and Petra. Their breasts and genitals were cut off and they were nailed to a wall. Petra was also disemboweled. Dagmar's body was found in the bedroom. Like her daughters, her breasts and genitals were nailed to the wall. A string was also tied around her heart and the string was nailed to the wall. Meanwhile, at the police station, Frank and Harold were talking openly about the bloodbath. Frank said that he was in the bedroom and his mother was looking at him in a way that he felt was inappropriate. So he picked up a clothes hanger and he beat her until she lost consciousness. 
When the beating started, Harold realized that the hour of killing was happening, so he started to play the organ and sing. Frank then moved on to Marina and Petra. He again used the clothes hanger and beat them into unconsciousness. Frank then started to mutilate the bodies. When the father and son were asked why none of the victims ran away or defended themselves when they were attacked, they said it was because the women had accepted that they had to die. Frank had talked openly about the hour of killing for a while and he said it could happen at any time. During the hour of killing, the women would be murdered and then mutilated because they were unclean. After they were dead, the women's souls would go directly to heaven. Dagmar, Marina, and Petra knew their role in the massacre and they accepted the fact that they would be murdered because they were serving God. Frank and Harold also didn't show any remorse because they thought they had sent the women to heaven. Both Frank and Harold were found unfit to go to trial and they were admitted to a psychiatric hospital. Sabine was sent to live in a coven and her current whereabouts are unknown. Thanks for watching this week's video. We hope you found it interesting. If you did, please subscribe. We post a new video every Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you want to check out some other creepy murder videos, please click on one of the videos on the screen now. And thanks again for watching.